We'll come back to the physiology of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, in, in this talk, what I will do is I will uh, resummarize, uh, revisit, if you will, the, um, the, the topics of uh, digestion and absorption for the three nutrients, uh, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and uh, fats. Before we talk about the um, digestion and the absorption, this is just a reminder of the different structures of the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. We have the lumen and then we have the epithelial layer, uh, which uh, basically contains enterocytes that contains microvilli. And then you have the different layers, mucosa and submucosa, muscularis and serosa. And inside the uh, um, the villi, um, we will we will see uh, a, a vein, artery, nerve, and also we see a lacteal, which is a, a lymphatic vessel. I want you to remember that the the final products, final digestion uh, products of um, carbohydrates and proteins gets into the the the, the vein first before it gets to the to the rest of the body whereas uh, fat digestion uh, products uh, gets into the lacteal so so we have two 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 routes basically two two methods uh, for for uh, transporting these uh, nutrients fat goes into the lacteal protein and carbohydrates get in, gets into the the veins blood vessel now the the type of, um, of digestion, as I mentioned before, um, there are two types, luminal or cavital and membranous or contact. The, the, way, the way I want you to understand this is, is the following. The first process takes place in the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. Any lumen in the gastrointestinal tract, in the oral cavity, in the stomach, in the intestine, we call that luminal or cavital digestion. Now, it gets to uh, the nutrients gets to a, a, a pretty small uh, size, but that size is not sufficient to get into the inside of the uh, enterocyte. Here, I want to stop and I want to tell you that there are three three steps before nutrients can be utilized by the body. You remember in the very first lecture we defined the gastrointestinal tract as a tube-like structure that provides the body including itself with nutrients, fluids, and electrolytes. Now you cannot expect that the piece of steak that you eat gets straight from your mouth to the different body systems, the cardiovascular, the respiratory, the urinary system, the reproductive system, the digestive system. It has to go through processes before the size of that, of the nutrient is sufficient enough to get into the different cells from the different systems. So the very first thing happen is we break it in the mouth and in the lumens of the of the gastrointestinal tract, stomach and intestines, we break it into a certain size, and we call that luminal or cavital. After that, when that material, when the product of the luminal or the cavital digestion touches or contacts the apical membrane of the enterocyte, what happens is it activates another set of enzymes, digestive enzymes, to further break it into smaller, smaller, smaller molecules. Those molecules now are able to cross the apical membrane and get inside the enterocyte. So this is the step number two. One is in the lumen, then in the membrane, and then the material gets into the inside of the enterocyte. After that, from the inside of the enterocyte, it goes to the either blood vessel 
if it was carbohydrate or protein, and it goes to the inside of the lacteal lumen if it was lipid metabolism or metabolite, I should say. So let's see how this thing, of course, after, after we get into a certain size in the lumen, we have to have certain, or even at the membrane, we have to have certain a, um, uh, vehicles to, to basically carry it to the inside of the cell or to the inside of the um, uh, blood vessel or the lacteal. So, so these methods are four. One is simple diffusion, basically very simply through the holes in the uh, in the in the membrane, in the apical membrane of the enterocyte. There are holes, there are pores. We call that pores. So simple diffusion, basically some of these nutrient gets straight in, in, inside these pores and gets into the uh, uh, inside of the enterocyte. Done. Nothing is required. Nothing is, is. Now, active transport, it requires some energy, effect, a, a effort, basically. It needs to spend some energy to get it, to push it from the lumen of the gut to the inside of the enterocyte. So it requires some energy. In the facilitated diffusion, it requires special molecules, we call that protein carriers, vehicles, special vehicles, basically, to carry certain things, to pull them from the wall or the apical membrane, which is the, 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 the membrane of the enterocyte, into the inside of the enterocyte, specific carrier proteins. And as I mentioned before, pinocytosis is basically happened for larger molecules, larger molecules. Okay, yeah, and, and you will study that more in, in immunology to be to, to be more specific when when you talk about um, swallowing of the of the cells uh, of microorganisms and things like that, large microorganisms, and then the the product of uh, or the process of of making antibodies starts and things like that. Now, these are the three nutrients that we're talking about. We're talking about carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Carbohydrates, proteins, and this is, these are basically the nutrients that we will, 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 will have. Okay, so what I will do is we'll talk about the carbohydrate digestion first, and then absorption. And then after that, we'll talk about protein digestion and then absorption. And then at the end, we will talk about fat digestion and absorption. Very simple. So, and we will apply the cavital or the luminal digestion and the membranous digestion as we go. This table summarizes the digestion of carbohydrates. Any carbohydrate, any carbohydrate in the mouth, in the stomach, or in the, in the intestine will be attacked by uh, an enzyme amylase. After the attack, this starch, this carbohydrate will be will be broken into different materials: dextrins, maltose, uh, maltotriose, uh, trihalose, lactose, sucrose, etc. This is in the lumen. Now, when we get the dextrins, maltotriose, maltose, trihalose, lactose, sucrose, when these nutrients touch the membrane of the enterocyte, the apical membrane, they activate another set of enzymes, digestive enzymes, glucoamylase, isomaltase, sucrase, lactase, trihalase. Once these enzymes are activated, they continue to break these materials, the dextrins, multitriose, maltose, etc., etc., they continue to break them into the final product, which is glucose, galactose, fructose. At this stage, glucose, galactose, and fructose are still at the level of the apical membrane or the membrane of the enterocyte. They are not inside the enterocyte. Now, we need to get them into the inside 
of the interior side. And how are we going to do that? Pretty simple. Pretty simple. We're going to get the glucose, galactose, and fructose into the inside of the into the inside of the interior side. We're going to pull them from the lumen now to the inside of the cell, the very first set of cell, which is the enterocyte. So glucose and galactose require a certain uh, a carrier protein. We call it SGLT1. Fructose, on the other hand, requires another carrier, which is called GLUT5. They pull these sugars from the outside now to the inside of the enterocyte. Now, once glucose, galactose, and fructose are inside the enterocyte, you have another carrier, which is GLUT2, that carries all three of them into the lumen of the blood vessel. So, two carriers to carry glucose, galactose, and then fructose into the inside of the enterocyte, then another carrier to carry it from the inside of the enterocyte to the lumen of the blood vessel. Now you have to remember that sometimes some patients, whether 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 humans or animals, they have sometimes a genetic a, a mutation of some sort or a disease that's that's manifested by the lack of one of these carrier proteins. So for and, and you have to explain how how this can affect them clinically. So for example, if you have a patient, small animal, large animal, a human with lack or loss of GLUT5, you will expect, again, based on what you studied in GI physiology, that this patient will not be able to carry fructose into the inside of the cell, and GLUT2 will have no fructose to carry to the inside of the blood vessel, even though you're feeding that human or animal patient, tons of fructose. There is no carrier to get them into the inside of the enterocyte or from the inside of the enterocyte to the lumen of the blood vessel. So when you take a blood sample of that patient, what you're going to see? You will see low levels of fructose or no levels of fructose because there's no fructose to start with. So that's that's the basic idea of carbohydrate both digestion and absorption again it's pretty simple amylase digests all kinds of carbohydrates until they reach a certain size with different names maltose maltriose sucrose fructose etc now these nutrients these sugars when they touch the apical membrane of the enterocyte, they activate a, a different set of enzymes, more specific enzymes, sucrase, trihalase, etc. Once these specific enzymes digest the sugars that are produced by amylase digestion, they produce the final product of carbohydrate digestion, and that is glucose, galactose, and fructose. Only these three sugars. Now, these are th three sugars, in order for the body to utilize them, they need first to cross into the inside of the enterocyte, and then from the inside of the enterocyte to the inside of the blood vessel, which is the vein, which after that, the portal vein, which will go basically to the liver, and then after that to the vena cava, and then to the heart, and then to the aorta, and then to the rest of the body. Glucose and galactose will require a specific carrier or vehicle to get them inside the cell, and that's SGLT1. Fructose needs a GLUT5. Once they are in the cell, all three sugars will need a carrier protein or a vehicle that's called GLUT2 that gets it from the inside of the enterocyte to the lumen of the blood vessel, done with the carbohydrate digestion and absorption. Now, let's go to the next nutrient, proteins. Proteins, in order for them, think about it like the piece of steak that you eat. 
they're not again this piece will not be utilized as is it needs to be broken what's the building blocks for proteins the building blocks for proteins are amino acids amino acids you put amino acids together they become protein so how how we will digest them first and then absorb them again get them into the inside of the cell the enterocyte and then from that cell the enterocyte into the lumen of the blood vessel so they can go to the heart and they can be distributed to the rest of the body let's see in the lumen oral cavity stomach and intestines you have two groups of enzymes that digest proteins we call that endopeptidase and exopeptidases endopeptidases and exopeptidases endopeptidases digest the inside of the protein exopeptidases digest the outside bonds of the protein this is in the lumen examples of the endopeptidases and the exopeptidases include pepsin trips trypsin chymotrypsin elastase and carboxypeptidase a and b now this is the lumen we need the second step of digestion which is membrane okay what happened in the membrane level at the membrane level you have another set of enzymes that's called enterokinases once the food once the food is digested by trypsin and chymotrypsin, elastase, carbox, carboxypeptidase A and B, and pepsin, and etc., once they reach a certain size, certain component, it touches the membrane of the enterocyte. Again, these are the two cells that you see here. Once they touch the membrane, it, they activate another group of enzymes that's called enterokinases. Enterokinases, on the other hand, start converting trypsinogen to more trypsin, and then it eats up, it digests the proteins all the way, all the way to give the final product, which is basically amino acids. Sometimes they're single, and sometimes they're sometimes two together or three together. We call that dipeptides or tripeptides. This is basically what happens. The exact thing we've talked about before. Protein in the lumen is digested by exo and endopeptidases. Done. It becomes amino acids and di and tripeptides. If it's amino acids, if it's single amino acids, there is no need for further digestion because it's done. It, this is the final product. So it gets into the inside of the enterocyte. Simple diffusion, there's nothing. If they are di and tri peptides, two or three together, some of them may get into the enterocyte. About 25% of them will get into the enterocyte. But the majority will do what? Will activate another group of, of, of proteases. We call that enterokinases. When you get the enterokinases with the di and tripeptides, these enterokinases start to break every single peptide bond in the di and tripeptides to convert them, all of them, to become what? I mean, single amino acids. And that's when they get into, again, to the inside of the cell. Again, when they are inside of the cell, they go with simple diffusion into the inside of the blood vessel. So they are not like the carbohydrates, glucose, galactose, and fructose, where they needed carrier proteins. These protein digestion product, which is the amino acids, they do not require any vehicle to carry them to the lumen of the blood vessel or to the lumen of the enterocyte. They come inside the enterocyte through the apical membrane of the enterocyte and to the lumen of the blood vessel by simple diffusion done with proteins so first you have exo and endopeptidases in the lumen in the membrane you have enterokinases done simple diffusion inside the cell 
simple diffusion into the veins and then to the portal vein to the to the liver and then to the vena cava to the heart to the aorta to the rest of the body basically this is the cycle so we talked about carbohydrates we've talked about proteins let's talk about the third and the last a component of food and that is fat lipid digestion will produce at the end cholesterol free fatty acids monoglycerides and glycerol unlike carbohydrates the end products of carbohydrates are glucose galactose and fructose the end product of protein digestion is free amino acids the end product of lipid digestion is cholesterol fatty acids monoglycerides and a uh, glycerol great First, in the lumen, we have lipases that hydrolyze the fat. After that, they get attacked by bile salts and phospholipids. We mentioned that phospholipids prevent the aggregation, whereas bile salts basically help lipase to hydrolyze the fat droplets the end of that will make a mycelial formation which is water uh, soluble Th this is basically what what the end product will be something that is water soluble so it can cross to the enterocyte to in the inside of the enterocyte and then to the lacteal Remember, this is fat. It does not go to the blood vessel directly. Well, except the glycerol. Glycerol does go to the blood vessel. But the other three components of, of, uh, of fat uh, digestion, which is cholesterol, fatty acids, and monoglycerides, they don't go to the, to the blood vessel directly. They instead go to the lacteal. Only glycerol gets to the blood vessel directly. Now, I will repeat the steps. First, in the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, what happens is the motility patterns, like the reservoir, like the antral pump, like the uh, uh, gastric emptying, like the MMCs, like the short distant peristalsis, like the short distant propulsive movement, all of these form fat droplets so they do break the fat but they don't break it into a, a a a size that is acceptable to get into or across the apical membrane of the enterocyte so what they do is basically they fragment the fat into droplets after that this is in the lumen oral cavity stomach and intestinal cavity luminal digestion again cavital or luminal digestion again hydrolysis starts hydrolysis starts by what by lipase digesting this fat either in the oral cavity stomach or in the intestine coming from the pancreas of course this process of of, of hydrolysis is called emulsification what does emulsification mean emulsification means to make the fat droplets more water soluble how are you going to make it more water soluble you're going to make it more water soluble so lipase can work even better on them by adding an electrical charge on it from the bile salts and also from the phospholipids which are amphipathic molecules these amphipathic molecules they are lipophilic and they are hydrophilic so they like the water and they like the lipid both characteristics so they prevent the aggregation of these fat droplets they keep them away from each other that's how lipase work more and more and more and more and more on them 
all three steps, gut motility, hydrolysis and emulsification, all of them are in the lumen. Now, all of them are or happen or occur in the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, which is oral cavity, stomach, gastric cavity, and then the intestinal cavity. The mycelial formation, which is the very last form of fat digestion, which is the water soluble, okay, happens at the level of the membrane. So basically, all what you have, all what you have is a bile salt, bile acid, same, bile salt or bile acid that's attached to a fatty acid that is attached to a fatty acid or a cholesterol or a monoglyceride. These are the three things that the bile salt or the bile acid is basically attached to. Now, we didn't say glycerol, as I mentioned. Glycerol does not, does not participate in the formation of the micelle because glycerol goes through simple diffusion through the enterocyte to the blood vessel lumen or to the lumen of the blood vessel just as proteins or amino acids free amino acids gets into the through the apical membrane into the inside of the enterocyte and then into the inside of the or the lumen of the uh, blood vessel by simple diffusion glycerol is the same but cholesterol fatty acids and monoglycerides are not the same. They are attached at the level of the apical membrane with what? With a bile acid, bile salt. We will look and see what happens after that. So the first three steps, gut motility, hydrolysis, and emulsification, happens in the lumen. My cell is at the membrane. Now, The hydrolysis come from lipase, the majority of it's into from lipase, which is activated by colipase, and then phospholipase A, which requires bile acids too, and then cholesterol esterhydrolase, which is basically less specific. But the main thing to remember is that lipase, phospholipase, and cholesterol esterhydrolase are all all enzymes that are required for the hydrolysis of fat. That's the most important thing to remember. All of them. Lipase, phospholipase, cholesterol, esterhydrolase are all required for the hydrolysis of fat in the lumen of the gut, oral cavity, stomach, and intestinal cavity. Only mycelial is at the level of the membrane of the apical membrane or the membrane of the enterocyte. Again, the basic structure of the, of the bile acid or bile salt, uh, a polar part, and then a nonpolar part, a polar part which comes from the carboxyl groups uh, and the hydroxyl groups, that's all. And then the nonpolar part is the, is the rest of, of, of this uh, structure. Now, here is the emulsification, the fat droplet that came from gut motility are, or is attacked by bile acids or bile salts and also phospholipids. When you have these molecules attacking the fat droplets, the bile salts and the phospholipids, this will activate or this will basically form an, out, an excellent medium for lipase and phospholipase A2 uh, to, to, or the cholesterol esterhydrolase 
to break more and more the fat droplets all the way to make them cholesterol or triglycerides or fatty acids not not triglycerides i'm sorry fatty acids free fatty acids monoglycerides i meant to say cholesterol so the lipase and the phospholipase a2 and the cholesterol ester hydrolase keep digesting emulsifying hydrolyzing the fat droplets all the way until they become either free fatty acids monoglycerides or cholesterol at that level along with the bile acids they are called micelle this is the micelle again a bile acid along with either free fatty acid or cholesterol or monoglyceride now at the membrane you need to carry them inside the enterocyte this is how they are carried into the inside of the enterocytes the cholesterol the fatty acids and the monoglycerides are basically attached or grabbed by fatty acids binding proteins FABP cholesterol gets into the inside of the enterocyte by simple diffusion it did not or it does not need a carrier only fatty acids and monoglycerides needs carriers FABP fatty acids binding proteins now in the inside of the enterocytes monoglycerides fatty acids and cholesterol all three of them are repackaged along with a protein inside the enterocyte that's called apoprotein apoprotein they are repackaged to form a molecule that's called chylomicron this chylomicron molecule is the one that actually leaves the enterocyte toward the lymphatic vessel the lacteal so monoglycerides and fatty acids require fatty acids binding proteins to get to the inside of the enterocyte cholesterol gets the inside of the enterocyte by simple diffusion just like glycerol at the bottom of the, the the picture glycerol gets into the inside of the enterocyte and to the blood vessel by simple diffusion just like amino acids protein digestion in the previous slides no carriers no energy no nothing so gets to the enterocyte gets to the blood vessel gl glycerol and then goes to the rest of the body by by uh, by the heart and the aorta cholesterol gets into the inside of the cell by simple diffusion but stays in the in the enterocyte until it's repackaged along with the other components to chylomicrons fatty acids and monoglycerides basically needs fatty acids binding proteins to pull them inside the the enterocyte and after that after that all of these components cholesterol fatty acids and monoglycerides along with a protein that's called apoprotein gets repackaged into a molecule that's called chylomicron once chylomicron is is, is formed this chylomicron molecule is the one that gets into the lymphatic a vessel which is the lacteal these are basically the steps for the digestion of the three different nutrients carbohydrates proteins and fat in summary carbohydrates well before the summary we have to remember that digestion 
occurs in two steps. One, luminal or cavital in the cavity or in the lumen of the gut, oral cavity, stomach, or intestine, and membranous at the level of the membrane of the enterocyte, which, which, which is the apical membrane. That's the other name for the membrane of the enterocyte. We call it apical membrane. Carbohydrates in the lumen is attacked by lipase. The products at the level of the membrane are attacked by specific digestive enzymes. The end product after this membranous digestion is glucose, galactose, fructose. To get to the inside of the cell, you need carrier proteins. After that, all three of them require one carrier protein to get them into the inside of the blood, of the lumen of the blood vessel. This is carbohydrates. Proteins in the lumen, they are attacked by endo and exopeptidases. Break them at the level of the membrane. They are attacked by enterokinases. It breaks them all the way to amino acids. Simple diffusion gets the, get, get, get them into the inside of the enterocyte, and simple diffusion get them into the lumen of the blood vessel. Amino acids, free amino acids, done. The third thing is lipid digestion and absorption. Lipid, by motility, it's broken into fat droplets. In the lumen of the gut, oral cavity, stomach, and intestine, is attacked by lipase and two other enzymes, phospholipase A and, and uh, a third one. After this, or, or, or all of this is called hydrolysis. So they become more water soluble at the lumen or in the lumen. At the level of the membrane now, you have a micelle formation. Micelle formation is a bile acid or bile salt attached to cholesterol, fatty acid, or monoglyceride. Glycerol, on the other hand, which is the fourth product of fat digestion, gets into the cell and to the lumen of the blood vessel by simple diffusion, just like proteins, amino acids. Cholesterol gets into the inside of the cell by simple diffusion, but stays inside the cell. Fatty acids and monoglycerides require fatty acids binding proteins to carry them from the membrane all the way to the inside of the cell. Once they are inside of the cell, the monoglycerides and fatty acids and cholesterol, they bind with a protein that's called apoprotein, repackaged again, into a molecule that's called chylomicron. Chylomicron, on the other hand, leaves the enterocyte to the lymphatic vessel by simple diffusion, and then goes to the thoracic duct, and then to the venous circulation of the body. This basically will summarize the digestion and absorption of the three nutrients.